Right. I wanted to talk today about winning at all costs. Of course, it's football season. So as everybody knows, that's the only thing, right? As Vince Lombardi said, winning isn't the winning isn't everything. Winning is the only thing he said to the Packers in 1965. And of course, uh, that quote has been quoted and misquoted by other people throughout the years. If you listen to his whole speech, there's a little more to it than the win at all costs mentality. But we often find that, uh, you know, the uh, the other quote that comes out is, um, uh, you know, if you don't finish first, you're second, right? So if you're second place, that means that you're the first loser. Uh, I've heard that statement before, right? And so that's sort of the, the coaching motiv motivation when you get out there. And in life, that seems to be more and more what we're faced with. Anybody that's followed sports over the years, you're famous uh, cheating scandals. Uh, there's probably some different 30 for 30 uh, ESPN type type situations that are out there that will go through all the different ways that people tried to win at all costs. And, um, you know, a couple of things that, that come along on that is that we can be disheartened that somebody would try and cheat or take advantage of the rules in order to win a match or win a game or win a gold medal, uh, you know, steroids and Ben Johnson is one of the famous ones here in Canada where he took steroids to win at all costs. And at the end, uh, when he kind of got caught, oh, it doesn't matter. I beat Carl, meaning Carl Lewis. And, and it was kind of a bit of a letdown here for Canada. He was a Canadian hero and, and disappointing how he would, go out there and try and win at all costs just to get the gold medal to beat Carl Lewis. And uh, on the other side, though, uh, there's a fencing champion by the name of Laurie Shong. And uh, he's a uh, uh, world champion uh, fencer from Canada. And anybody, you know, fencing, it's like he would have been good in lightsaber duels in Star Wars, probably, or any of that stuff. But uh, he was in the finals of the world championship. And there he is out there and gold medal cameras on and everything. And he goes out and suddenly the opponent uh, had a, a touch or Laurie Shong's uh, saber had hit the ground by mistake and not made contact with the other opponent. Because that's the idea is that you, you with your sword, you want to obviously in, in the old days of the the three musketeers and and d'artagnan and all of that from the french nobles and the, the stories of that was you try and cut the person through and he touched the the sword or the the fencing saber on the ground and the light went off and everybody cheered and the point was awarded to him and he won the world championship except and the opponent kind of thought something funny happened. And uh, Laurie just went, I can't do it. I can't take the world championship this way that my saber would touch the ground and somehow I would be awarded. I know that I didn't win this. So he went to the judges and he said, reset that. That was my mistake. I hit the saber to the ground. I did not make contact with the opponent. And again, now we're into sudden death, everything's tied, and he had won the world championship. Everybody had accepted the result. He was the only one that knew that he had made that mistake. Now they went on, they went on and battled back and forth, and eventually he did get the winning point, and he was crowned world champion. In other words, he was not going to allow a mistake to give him the crown and be victorious and we were refereeing volleyball on the weekend and and as you know of course uh, uh coaching and and being in sports that's a one of my one of my favorite sports and, and one of the things and one of the rules is that if the ball is hit out of bounds there it goes it's on its way out of bounds and if a player touches it with the little pinky you know little paint that's all it has to do is just go off the the pinky you know the 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 fingers so there's the ball and it touches off the fingers and if that little touch awards me the point if i'm the hitter even though i hit it out of bounds if it's touched i get the point 
And as a referee and as a lines keeper, it's often very difficult to make that determination. Did it touch off the player or not? And anybody that has watched the Olympics, they have the video review where the coach will stand up and say, I want a video review on it. And after seeing some of the video reviews on touch calls in volleyball, I don't feel so bad about missing it as a referee or as a lines keeper, because you're looking and you're going, I don't think that touched. And so you go out as a lines keeper and suddenly on video review, they show that it just barely brushed off the finger and they go point awarded to the, to the other team. And uh, the, the call in the field is overruled uh, based on that judgment. Now, I, I will tell you that there is a refreshing trend that does happen out there. And it, it's common among the, the Christian universities. So we were refereeing the match and it had Columbia Bible College, which is a seminary school that plays in the league. And the Camosun Chargers, that's our Victoria team, hit the ball out of bounds. And I looked and I went, Nah, maybe that went over the block, but Kamosin was sure going, no, 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 no. They touched it. They touched it. And, uh, you know, the point was awarded to Columbia Bible College, but then the player on Columbia Bible College went, no, nope, I touched it and called herself on the touch and Kamosin won the point. And I just said, I love it. That's the, what we call the honor call because God knew and the players knew and you know the the, the coach was like what, what who touched it and i said to the coach your player called herself in the touch oh good for you okay that's the right thing to do is to be honorable and to win with honor now we you know bobby and i we like golfing and of course that's one thing about golfers as well that i must mention is that when you golf you call your own penalty so i I double clutch the, the ball or I double stroke or the ball move when I was addressing the ball. And therefore, uh, you know, I call a penalty on myself and you can look through the golf channel to famous times when golfers would not win the tournament based on the fact that, that, um, you know, a stroke penalty uh, would have, if they didn't call the penalty on themselves, maybe they win, but they would never, ever, ever. And we're talking million dollar checks here uh, would never do it. Now, unfortunately, some golfers over the years have tried to get away with it. And then <laughs> the, the funny thing is now with all the different camera angles and all the different videos on the course, you'll get people that will tweet or text in <laughs> to the, to the, uh, to, to the judges. And so you watch the golf tournament and sort of, Four holes later, the, uh, the the official will come up and say, "Hey, we were <laughs> we, we were dialed in on this by somebody that sent us a text message, a tweet, a Facebook post, or on our social media that you uh, grounded your club in the sand trap." And the only way we could do it was to actually go back and review the tape. Do you have anything you want to confess? what are you talking about? And so then the video thing, and, and he ends up getting a two stroke penalty, you know, sort of six hole later because somebody called him on it. So it, it didn't pay off to try and get away with it because the cameras never lie and it's there, but you, you can imagine that when the, the temptation that's there, Oh, if I could only get away with this, that'll be fine. Nobody's looking. Who's going to know God will know and your conscience will get the better of you. So it's always best to, to realize that and to uh, to try and do things uh, properly and let God take care of things and trust that that He's got things in control and you play your best out there on the field of play and it's never okay to stand on the podium of the Olympics and say that I won the gold medal knowing that well maybe you didn't really win the gold medal so we do have the heroes and we do have the anti heroes out there and I'm sure. In your head, you're probably running through another 10 scenarios that I could have mentioned. Now, in the Bible, of course, we have a, a number of different situations that have come up, and we can certainly draw on occasions where people, through their own justification or otherwise, 
uh, not necessarily the win at all costs, but maybe they try and get away with something because they think that somehow this is going to be the way to help God. Abraham, as you uh, know the story, uh, left his family and was told to go to the land prepared for you, the land of Canaan. And then he took Lot with him. Now that wasn't mentioned. He said, leave everybody and go. But Abraham, of course, well, you know, I'll bring Lot because maybe my nephew is going to be my my heir because I'm getting old and I don't have any kids. And that caused a whole bunch of problems. So it, it was not really trusting in God, uh, but it was sort of, I'm going to take matters into my own hands here and I'll just help God out. And later on, of course, when he's in Egypt, uh, and you can read through the whole story about how that bringing Lot in kind of brought a few problems along the way. And Abraham, when he's in Egypt, now, uh, if you've been following the daily vo devotional, you remember this uh, uh, about a month ago, where he, he uh, passes off his wife, Sarai, as uh, his, uh, his sister. And everybody goes, well, that's sort of true. Yeah, it's sort of true. But it was what we call the, the sort of white lie. I don't want to have her killed or me killed or uh, so I'll, I'll lie. And then that way, Pharaoh's not going to kill me. And his wife ends up becoming part of Pharaoh's harem. And uh, of course, in a dream, uh, suddenly all these plagues start coming on Egypt and Pharaoh's alerted by the power of God that, hey, that is somebody's wife. Don't you touch her. And uh, of course, uh, Abraham is, uh, is uh, giving his wife back. And Pharaoh said, why did you lie to me? Well, I thought you were going to kill me because she's quite beautiful. Well, you, you know, I'm not going to do that. God told me not to touch you. So just leave well enough alone. And of course, the most famous one of trying to help things along rather than trusting God was the fact that Sarah, who was Sarai, and then eventually Sarah, uh, she says to Abraham, look, uh, I, I'm a bit old and, you know, childbearing is probably not my thing. So you can have my handmaiden and Hagar and you can uh, have a child with her and that's going to be the heir. And so now we see one of the, the repercussions of let's win at all costs. We're going to make God's promises come true and we're not going to have faith enough to maybe just wait upon the Lord and renew our strength. He's going to raise us up on eagle's wings. So rather than following what the word of God said is that trust in me and rely on me always and, and I will make the path clear and all of these things that, that are there and evident. And again, you know, we're, we're not here to, to condemn Abraham. We're just here to learn some things because obviously through all of this, he gets uh, uh, some great blessing and some great learning. And God is not, that's it, you're done uh, because of this. But uh, eventually he does have a son through Hagar named Ishmael. And as we know, Ishmael is the, the father of basically down through the Arabs and, and now the, the Muslim and the Islamic faith, blessed by God to be a great nation, but they would always be at war and in the presence of the brother. And we will see that Isaac, eventually the child of promise. So at that point, we've got all of these things that have resulted from the, hey, let's win at all costs, we'll make things happen. And we're not going to stand back and, and trust God, okay? There's no excuse for laziness to say, hey, I'm just going to sit at home and somehow magically the phone's going to ring, okay? I don't want anybody to hear that in any of these messages. Uh, sometimes we have to pray, we have to be built up, we have to read the word, and we have to be led by God, but we have to understand that God is going to be the one that's going to direct our steps and going to guide us into all things. So there's that balance there. Uh, wait upon the Lord, but don't uh, sit there saying there's a, a lion in the street. I, I, I'm too scared to go out or I better wait till God takes care of that. Sometimes the sword is given to you to take care of that lion or to stand and rebuke that lion and tell that lion to go. And if that's the call of the Lord, then take up that mantle and, and get on with it. All right. Now, Jacob, the deceiver, uh, we've been talking a lot about this. And again, if this is 
familiar territory for those that have been following the daily devotional. Uh, by the way, today, tonight will be the final episode, episode 365. Uh, hopefully, I'll have that posted after the football game tonight. We were joking about maybe we should do a live broadcast just to say that we've reached it, but 365 10 minute daily devotionals tomorrow will be the first one by Chris uh, Stark Stank, Stanky Chris of uh, Brisbane will be taking over so uh, good luck give him your support your clicks and your likes and hopefully we'll continue on to see these little 10 minute devotionals develop uh, that if you're bored you got nothing to do you can go on to the YouTube channel and and right now after today you will have 72 hours of 10 minute devotionals that you could just run on a loop there you go. Uh, if you have trouble sleeping, that might be a good aid as well. All right, Jacob the deceiver. Let's go, Anthony. Genesis 27, verse 1. Genesis 27, verse 1, if you're following along and taking notes. Now, of course, we can remember, or maybe we can. Again, I, I always apologize. I never want to be one of those those pastors that stands up here and says, as you all know the story, because Maybe some people don't know the story, or maybe somebody's hearing it for the first time. Bobby reminded me that uh, during his time in San Pedro that uh, he was talking to one brother and said, oh, yeah, as you know, the story about this. And the brother didn't have any idea. And it was an eye opener that, hey, we, we might be losing a little bit here. We maybe need to go back and, and make sure that everybody is on the same page if people aren't reading the word of god if people haven't been to different sunday schools then it's up to us and that parents uh make sure that your children are reading and understanding these stories so jacob is the is a son and esau is the other son and jacob came out second grabbing the heel of his brother so technically they were twins they were warring in the belly, and they came out, and Jacob came out second, grabbing the heel of the first one. So they gave him the wonderful title. Imagine this, parents, naming, you know, it's like, think about what you name your child, because that's what they're going to have to live with the rest of their life. And if you uh, give your child a, you know, a funny or a, a strange name, then, uh, you know, maybe they're, they're going to have to live with it. And Jacob means heel grabber. Now, eventually, it means the deceiver or, or the supplanter, uh, as we see. But literally, Jacob is the grabber of the heel, because that's what they saw when he came out of the, the womb. So this guy had to live with that name all his life. And of course, it, it came true. Now, this is the winning at all costs. Now, Mama kind of knew that, that, you know, Isaac was... Uh, there's some troubles here. The, this can go back to family issues where you've got Jacob and, uh, uh, and Esau, and you've got Isaac and Ishmael, and you've got parents and, and different uh, dynamics there that are causing jealousy and, and other things. So Isaac woke, grew up kind of a, a messed up kid. His dad was going to kill him, right? There's Isaac on the altar and his dad's got a knife and he's going to cut him through now it's not mentioned in the bible but that little traumatic incident uh probably affected isaac and then down the road when uh, when jacob and esau come out he's i love esau man he's the captain of the football team he can hit sixes in cricket he can throw touchdowns and kick field goals and 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 you know shoot below par in golf and he's 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 our guy shoot a gun and 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 all the rest of it he's the captain all right let's get on with it though and the deception so mama knew that jacob was the one that was going to be blessed by god the promise was his esau had given up his birthright for the bowl of stew and it was written and it was revealed Jacob's going to get the blessing. But what did we do? Well, we better take care of this and we better win at all costs. So we see here the great deception, Genesis 27.1. And it came to pass 
that when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau, his eldest son, unto him. My son, he said unto him, behold, here I am. And he said, behold, I am old. I know not the day of my death. Now, therefore, take, I pray thee, thy weapons, thy quiver and thy bowl, and go out to the field and get take me some venison and make me savory meat such as I love and bring it to me that I may eat and my soul may bless thee before I die. Well, mama comes in, Rebecca, and I, I know who's going to be the, the blessing here. And, and dad's not listening. So the women have to intervene when dad is not praying, reading the word of God, being led by the spirit. So mama's going to get in there. And Rebecca heard when Isaac spake to Esau, his son. And Esau went out to the field to hunt for venison and to bring it. And Rebekah spake unto Jacob, her son, saying, Behold, I heard thy father speak unto Esau, thy brother, saying, Bring me venison and make me savory meat that I may eat and bless thee before the Lord before my death. All right. So we've got the scenario here where there's some deception going on here. And if we read through the story and you can do it, mama helps uh, Jacob in the kitchen and makes the best venison possible. And Jacob comes in before the father wearing fur and skins. And yeah, he's coached by dad, but this little bit of deception is going to cause some problems here. Like we said, this is, I'm going to win at all costs. I'm going to take matters into my own hands. I am not going to trust God. And I'm going to push this uh, forward. And, um, and there you go. So they, they did all that. And, and Jacob steals the blessing. And Esau comes in and, and goes, what, what do you mean? Uh, what do you mean you bless Jacob? That deceiver. I'm going to get him. And Jacob ends up going away to his, uh, to his uncle Laban's place. And now we see that what... what uh, <laughs> What comes around goes around, right? And we're going to see the deceiver get deceived a little bit later on here. So we don't know what God's plan is. All we know is that God said his plan was, was there and that it was going to be fine. It was going to be taken care of. But the win at all costs attitude, rather than the Lori Shang saying, no, I'm, I'm not going to do that, Mom. I, I am not going to do that. God said it's my blessing. I'm going to trust him that things are going to work out, and the blessing is going to be mine, and I don't want to cause any problems between me and my brother. And not only that, uh, you know, if you do the crime, you do the time. You've heard of that saying? Well, you can't have this much lying and deception and somehow think that everything's going to be perfect. Yeah, you... You won. You got the blessing. But now we're going to see things unfold that that it's going to have some consequences to it. And that's the, the trouble. It's better to win with honor than to win at all costs, because then you will always have your honor. If you hold that gold medal up and you won it by deceit, then it'll eat away at you and, and there will be consequences to it. So as we see a little while later, with Laban, uh, Jacob goes, all right, I love this girl, Rachel. She's very beautiful. And Leah's got nice eyes, but, you know, she's not really my, my type of woman. So I'm going to go after the younger, uh, the younger girl, and I'm going to go after Rachel. And in Genesis 29, verse 18, let's pop that up and let's see how the deceiver gets deceived. In 29, 18, and Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve thee seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. And Laban said, it is better that I give her to thee than I should give her to another man. Abide with me. And Jacob served seven years for Rachel. And they seemed like him but a few days for the love he had for her. How romantic, how beautiful. And Jacob said unto Laban, give me my wife for my days are fulfilled that I may go in unto her. So now there's a big feast, and we see that, that everything is, uh, is being prepared. They're having a wedding feast, and everything's all there. And uh, 
Laban says, all right, Leah, come here. Don't worry. You're my older daughter. And, uh, and Rachel, you just go over there. Uh, yeah, and Rachel probably would have been just distraught at this point. Uh, anybody that knows the story, you know what's happening here. Jacob's already, and I'm sure that uh, with the partying, there might have been a little bit of drinking, a little bit of dancing, a little bit of fun. And so Jacob goes into the tent. And of course, ev everybody's veiled. It's very dark. It's late at night. And it's Leah. But Jacob doesn't know that. And in, in verse 25, if you're reading along, and it came to pass in the morning, behold, it was Leah. That's it. The marriage is done. You've had sex with her. It's over. And he said unto Laban, what is this that thou hast done to me? Did I not serve thee for Rachel? Wherefore then hast thou beguiled me? And you can read on. And basically he says that, you know, the tradition and the custom is that the older daughter has to be married first. So I, I had to do it. You know, it's, uh, but I'll tell you what, work for me another seven years and, and I'll give you Rachel right away. So now what do we got? We got sister jealousy. We've got handmaidens. We've got intrigue. We've got the real housewives of Haran. If you want to talk about it here, uh, it's, it's like a, a reality show where uh, sibling rivalry would eventually come down. Joseph would come along. Jealousy, sold into slavery. All of these things we can say is God's plan because Joseph came through and, and it all turned out okay. But you, you often wonder if we had just stood back and said, okay, we're going to allow God to manifest it because if it's declared, that Jacob's going to get the blessing. He's going to get the blessing, right? If God says he's going to provide you salvation and honor, is that right or is that a lie? I would say that if God says it and he declares it, it's the truth. So take your blessing. Come before the altar of grace. If God says he will heal you, it's a promise and it's there. You have faith. You come before the altar. You pray boldly and understand that these victories are yours. If you rob God, if you hold back from God, if you try to take things into your own hands to maybe win at all costs, then down the road, you might win in the short term, but in the long term, there'll be consequences. Does it say some of these things are salvation issues that will leave you there? We are always in the case of a forgiving, loving God, and all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, all of us have made mistakes, all of us have been in tempting situations where maybe we tell the white lie, maybe we do a little bit of uh, manipulating here to try and, uh, oh, God will understand. It's not necessarily saying that you're losing your salvation, but you're losing out on the bigger blessing because now you can see the victory of God. Remember the story of Gideon, where God basically said, get rid of the 10,000, get rid of the 1,000, 300 people are going to rout this army because I don't want you to think that it's you. And so the story of Gideon is 300 against the huge army. They break their, their lamps, the big light, make the noise, and the army utterly cuts himself through, and God is victorious. Rather than saying, you know, we're going to build this army up. We're going to train them. We're going to get massive weapons. And we're going to go in there and we're going to take these guys head on. That doesn't give God the victory. That gives you and your own strength the victory. And it might have turned out. But how much better is it if we allow God to do it? So we got all this. Now here's a situation where David, he was good. His heart was for the Lord. He was the the real king of Israel, where we see that um, he was not willing to win at all costs. So there are cases, it's not all doom and gloom. Not everybody messed up here, even though David eventually did make some mistakes. At this point, he was at his high point. First Samuel 24, verse 1. Let's read through and, and see that it is possible to do things right. 
And it came to pass when Saul was returned from following the Philistines, that it was told him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of in, in Gendi, in, Gen, in Gendi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of Israel and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats. And he came to the sheep coats by the way, and there was a cave. And Saul went in to cover his feet. And David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. So it's all dark. Saul can't see anything. Come in from the light into a dark thing. He can't see a thing. In verse 4, And the men of David said unto him, Behold, the day which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it seemed good unto thee. Then David arose and cut the skirt off of Saul's robe privily. So Saul's in there going to use the, the banyos or the bathroom, the toilet. And uh, David snuck up behind him and just took a little clip off of Saul's skirt and, and let him go. All right, verse 5. And it came to pass afterwards that David's heart smote him because he cut Saul's skirt. And he said unto his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth my hand against him, seeing he is anointed of the Lord. So David stayed his servants with, this, with these words and suffered them not to rise against Saul. But Saul rose up out of the cave and went on his way. David also arose afterwards and went out of the cave and cried after Saul, saying, my Lord, the king, when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed himself. And David said to Saul, wherefore hearest thou men's words, saying, behold, David seeketh thy hurt. Why are you coming after me? And verse 10, behold, this day thy eyes have seen how the Lord hath delivered thee into my hand in the cave, and some bade me to kill thee. But mine eyes spared thee, and I said, I will not put forth my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Very powerful. And we can surmise that maybe God did bring Saul to him, and David had that opportunity to do it. Just like Mama intervening with, uh, with Jacob to say, let's get the venison, or let's get the blessing, because dad's not listening. And stealing the blessing caused all those kind of dramas. Now, had David cut him through, sure, it would have been over. The civil war would have been done. David would have been king. But that would have always been on his record. You became king because you killed the king. And maybe there would have been further civil war. Maybe there would have been not as many people rallying behind him as the true anointed king of Israel. So we don't know what those consequences are. All we know is that David said, I'm not winning at all costs. God's in charge. I trust him. Now, in 1 Samuel 31, we see the end of Saul. And David only had to wait a while. And, of course, there was still more. Saul was still, you know, he walked away, but he was still kind of chasing David down, trying to get him. And in verse 1, now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell down slain in the mount of Jeboah. And the Philistines followed hard after Saul and upon his sons. And the Philistines slew Jonathan, Abinad, Malachusia, Saul's sons. So that's it. There's the lineage done. And the battle went sore against Saul. And the archers hit him, and he was sore wounded of the archers. Then Saul said to his armor bearer, draw thy sword and thrust me through therewith, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and abuse me. And his armor bearer would not, for he was sore afraid. And then Saul took a sword and fell upon it, fell upon his sword. And thus came the end of Saul, the way God had intended. And in fact, at that point, because we know one thing, David had a, if anybody knows the story, David and Jonathan were buddies, and uh, they had a they had a pact that they were friends for life and would always look out for each other. And so we know David would never have killed Jonathan. And so had David killed Saul, then 
maybe Jonathan would have been seen as the rightful king of Israel. But by letting things play out according to God's plan, the whole lineage was wiped out. So there was no heir for Saul to sort of have dual kings going at the same time. And thus, David, by not winning at all costs, won everything according to God's plan. And he wouldn't touch the anointed. I think that's an important thing for us to remember. If God has anointed somebody, we have to have the proper respect for them. If God has raised somebody up and done that. Now, you know, again, as we said, Ishmael was blessed by God. That is God's anointed, the Ishmaelites down through uh, the Muslim. They were proclaimed, and we might have our differences, we might have uh, you know, our problem, but that's the anointed. The children of Israel are God's anointed people as well. We have to keep that in mind. Yes, they might have a problem recognizing Jesus as the Messiah, but they are still God's anointed. So it behooves us as Christians that uh, we have to respect God's anointing and let God take care of it. There would never, ever, ever in the Christian church any justification for uh, massacring or, or hurting or bringing harm to, to either of these, since they are the anointed of God. That's just a, a little side note. So we told you about Gideon. We told you about that. There's lots of stories in there, but let's just finish off with a few triumphant Christ. 2 Corinthians 2.14 says, Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Now, that, that, just as we read that, just take a look at that. God is going to cause us to triumph. And that's not a motorbike or whatever. That, that We're going to triumph. Ultimately, the victory is ours. Call your own touches. Call your own penalties in, in uh, football or in golf. Whatever it is, at the end of the day, the victory and the triumph will be raised up through God. And speaking of that, we got the uh, Olympics coming up, and and you know I, I I think about the athletes that are there, and there are you know people saying, oh, it's not fair. The athletes should speak up against political situations going on there, and and there is probably some justification for that. And some people are saying, oh, look at that. These athletes are winning at all costs, keeping silent against the atrocities that are going on. They should be using their platform. I, I, I try to stay out of that. I just trust that God is in control. But there is some thought there that if you're going to the Olympics that are on in communist China right now, are you letting down the team? So people in that situation you should have the courage to say, look, if you are persecuting and not allowing Christians to meet, if you are, as I said, God's anointed the, uh, the children of Ishmael and down through the Muslims, uh, a genocide against Uyghurs is probably, you know, forced abortion, sterilization, and, and internment camps, probably not God's plan. I'm not over there. I, I really have no ability to affect that except to say, Obviously, that shouldn't happen. And uh, but to to you know, for the athletes that are there, uh, we hope that they win with honor. And the Olympic scripture is First Corinthians nine twenty four. Yes, the Olympics specifically are written about in the Bible. Uh, Paul is talking about the Olympic games that were going on in Greece at the time. And in 1 Corinthians 9 says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run ye, uh, so run that ye may obtain. And in verse 25, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown or the crown of leaves. But we, an incorruptible crown, that's, or incorruptible. And it says that Paul's using that as an, as an analogy. You know, look, they work hard. They, they're very disciplined. And when we look at the athletes, when we look at the Olympics, when we look at all of these people,
people, when we watch the football games in a couple of minutes, what? We're going to have a second meeting, aren't we? Okay, well, we, we, maybe we'll watch the, the football game, or maybe if you're in Winnipeg, there's a cricket test match on that you'd rather watch instead, right? But the whole point is, is that the discipline and the effort in sports is immense. And having been involved in sports all my life, I really take these to heart that there is a good Christian aspect in people being involved in sports and really learning discipline and striving for mastery. So we said, winning at all costs is never okay. And even greater than that is that if you win on this lifetime, you get a crown that's corruptible. You can't take it with you. It's going to burn on the last day. But if we run our race with honor, we get an incorruptible crown. And that is eternity ruling and reigning with Christ on that last day when he returns. As it says in Matthew 16, 26, for what is a man profited if he gained the whole world, win at all costs, and lose his soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So look at those words and think about that. It's a beautiful thing that we have been called to serve the Lord. It's a beautiful thing that we have been given opportunities. It's a beautiful thing that maybe at times our enemies are going to be brought towards us. But if they are anointed of God, we'll let God take care of it. We'll let God deal with the, with the people that maybe don't have our best interests in mind. Never cower, never sit on the couch, no excuse for laziness. And, oh, I'm just going to pray about it and we'll let God take care of it. No, if you are built up in the word of God, you get out there, you get going, and you preach the word with conviction. Do it honorably. Do it for the Lord and understand that your treasures are stored up in heaven. And all the people said.